We begin with the Lehigh Valley Railroad in their Lehighton Yard. Lehighton is about 30 miles from Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Decades ago, coal went to the steel mill in Bethlehem. BLV used groups of small SW-8s in yard and transfer work. They were built in 1950 to 1952. Their 27 total were equipped with multiple unit controls and even dynamic brakes. With five units, the total of 180,000 pounds of tractive effort was spread over the 40 wheels and 20 traction motors without a fear of wheel slip. This Baldwin DS4-4-1000 switcher was built in 1950. It was one of nine on the LV. This presentation is about the transformation of a large section of the northeastern economy. The story begins here with anthracite coal. Nearly all of this hard, energy-dense coal came from the Anthracite Valley region of the Appalachian Mountain Range, running through Pennsylvania. The coal seams are situated between the Delaware and Susquehanna rivers. As you can see, the coal deposits attracted a number of competing railroads. The ones we'll cover here are shown in various colors. The red lines represent the Lehigh Valley Railroad. The LV operated a little over a thousand miles of track. The main line stretched from Buffalo, New York and Lake Erie down to New York and Newark on the eastern seaboard. Anthracite was two times more expensive than ordinary bituminous coal, explaining how these small regional roads became wealthy in the early years. Anthracite coal was superior for heating large urban buildings in densely populated areas. This was due to their great reduction of visible smoke and soot. At first, canals and rivers were used to bring coal down to the city markets. This was a poor way to transport down to cities and much of the coal wound up sunk and scattered. Anthracite coal fueled the growing steel plants that made the rails that replaced the canals. From then on, coal movement was by railroads. Shortly after the U.S. Civil War was over in 1865, U.S. steel production sharply increased by adopting the British Bessemer process. U.S. steel production became the highest in the world. In an era when a nation's economic power was measured by how much steel it produced, the U.S. and Pennsylvania economies were very strong. Strong enough to even support the excessive number of regional railroads. Until dieselization took hold in the 1950s, the same railroads burned some of the coal as locomotive fuel. It took some research to learn how to design locomotives that could burn the anthracite coal, compared to the more common bituminous coal. The main cities in the area of the Lehigh Valley are Allentown, Bethlehem, and Easton. The country's second largest steel producing plant was once located in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Now that is just a memory. Before oil was promoted to its pedestal, coal was king here. Anthracite was also taken to the docks on the Atlantic Ocean. The Lehigh Valley logo on the front of its diesels featured a black diamond with the letters LV. This chart shows the anthracite production in the U.S. from 1950 to more recent times. You can see a sharp drop. By the mid-1960s, all the smaller coal hauling roads were scrambling for replacement business opportunities. Lehighton is in Carbon County, Pennsylvania. The railroad was once the biggest employer here. The 
It's 1970. The demand for hard coal has plummeted. The Lehigh Valley has been holding on by connecting bridge traffic between other railroads. By July, they would be bankrupt. They operated in bankruptcy until 1976, when they would be unceremoniously absorbed into Conrail. Leading this westbound freight is an Alco C420, number 415, followed by a collection of EMD power. After dropping off the train, the power will run back by us to be serviced. This was a major facility for equipment maintenance. The first and third units are GP38-ACs bought in 1971. The LV owned four of these. Number 300 is a GP9, one of two bought in 1959. The next scene will bring two Alco C628s. These are six axle diesels bought in 1965 to 1967, filling a group of 17 units. The C stands for Century Series, the last of Alco production in the U.S. Three more running east toward Bethlehem will be followed by an eastbound led by a pair of Alco C420s with a pair of C628s pushing up the grade. Black and white and red colors were the as-delivered colors that the LV used at the time of delivery. They were nicknamed the White Elephants. F7 Unit 562, built in 1951, and the B Unit number 521, from a 1948 order, helped quickly end the steam era on the LV. The last unit, number 7642, came from the Pennsylvania Railroad with several other RS-11s. Only these from the Pensy had four-digit numbers. After some time in the shop, three more Alcos are added on. Miles timetable east is Bethlehem Yard. These Expensy RS11s have been repainted in the Cornell Red color scheme. 
In an era back then of increasingly dull and somber paint schemes, this was one of the more attractive ones. The Lehigh Valley Railroad was built to move anthracite coal, known as hard coal, as its primary task. It ran from Mock Chunk down to Easton, Pennsylvania by 1855. It reached into New York City by partnerships with the Central Railroad of New Jersey. By 1890, the tracks extended to Lake Ontario and Lake Erie. The Lehigh Valley had a total of 1,300 track miles back then. At the time, a New York City to the Great Lakes system looked like a very solid business model. The problem was that it was a model duplicated by far too many others in the region. High Valley Railroad was ordered to cease operation of its six steamships on the Great Lakes. This economic knife in the back was part of the Panama Canal Act of 1915. Lehigh and Hudson River Railroad ran between Easton, Pennsylvania and Maybrook, New York. It was the smallest road in a tough neighborhood. This map shows the other regional roads it had to fit in with and make a living as another bridge line. It went bankrupt by 1972 and met the same ending by being tossed into Conrail's formation in 1976. The depression of the 1930s laid a heavy hand on all the railroads. All the planning of the 1920s evaporated. Survival was all that mattered then. The Pennsylvania Railroad bought control of the Lehigh Valley during this time. Demand for anthracite coal dropped off until World War II. Things rebounded during the war, but not enough to carry the railroad into the 1950s in good financial health. To cut down on labor costs, this was one of the first railroads to convert to all diesel power by 1951. The main cities in the area of the Lehigh Valley are Allentown, Bethlehem, and Easton. The country's second largest steel producing plant was once located in Bethlehem. Three GP38-2s ran by in descending numerical order, were on the north bank of the Lehigh River with the state hospital up on the distant bluff. 
This site originally was the Central Railroad of New Jersey's yard. The next scene is at the same location with a pair of SW8s, often referred to as pups, due to their small size. The Lehigh Valley was one of the smaller sized roads that endeavored to shift its business more to carrying bridge traffic from other roads. The longest haul would be from New York City to Buffalo, New York. As the crow flies, that is around 300 miles. As a bridge line, that became insufficient mileage as the years would go by to make any type of profit. Eventually, the baseline for profit would climb to more like 800 miles. The next scene is one of the former nine Pensy Alco RS-11 units in Lehigh Valley colors crossing the Lehigh River and its adjacent canal. When Penn Central was formed by the Pensy and the New York Central, there was a stipulation from the ICC. The Pensy was ordered to offer the Lehigh Valley to the Norfolk and Western and the CNO. Neither found the LV worth taking. It's interesting to ponder some what-ifs in railroad mergers. One could have been with the Wabash and the Lehigh Valley. Both were owned by the Pensy, and the Penn Central merger could have been a reason to force this on the Pensy as a condition. They could have made an end-to-end -end system stretching from Kansas City to Chicago and into Buffalo to meet the LV and extend seamlessly to New York City. They already had a history of good cooperation in running trains together. Instead, the Wabash wound up with the Norfolk and Western, even though the Norfolk and Western also gained the Nickel Plate Road that was almost the twin of the Wabash. 
and the Lehigh Valley was left to wither. The Lehigh Valley Railroad was bankrupt by July 1970. By 1976, it was rolled into the newly formed Conrail.